everybody, and welcome to a new Agile IT Brown Bag. I'm your host, Sean Spicer. Today, we're going to do a quick dive into NIST Special Publication 800-172, the recently released Enhanced Security Requirements for Protecting Controlled and Classified Information. 172 came out in draft in mid-2020 and was published on February 2nd of 2021. It provides additional controls that can be specified by a federal agency whose CUI is associated with critical programs or high-value assets. It's fairly short for a NIST document coming in at 73 pages and covers 35 new enhanced requirements that build on those controls in NIST 800-171. I feel it's pretty elegant in its organization as well as its impacts for the size that it comes in at. Now, if you do want to take a look at this, it is available at csrc.nist.gov. You can just Google NIST 800-172. This will be the first link that comes up and definitely worth a read. There's some really good stuff in here. But let's look at what it is. So who's impacted by the new guidance? And it's kind of complicated, but I'll build out how it fits into DFARS and CMMC in a moment. At the core, 172 is meant to provide enhanced safeguards for systems that are associated with critical programs and high value assets, like I said before. Now, these determinations are made at the discretion of the organization that owns the CUI and will be specified in part or in whole in individual contracts. Now, this is interesting as it means that some contracts will possibly contain specific controls that must be met, but not the entirety of 800-172. Now, I don't have a crystal ball, but I expect that for expedience sake, we will almost always see 172 required in total. So let's look at how it fits with FAR and then within the levels of CMMC. So I've covered a different version of this build out on my video about how we got to CMMC. So I'm gonna zoom through this in order to get to how NIST 800-172 stacks with the other cybersecurity regulations. So we start with FAR, which is concerned with defending federal contract information. Then DFARS 7012 adds atop that for safeguarding control and classified information with NIST 800-171. These were performed via self-certification with system security plans and plans of action and milestones or mitigations. Failure to do this right can lead to false claims acts judgment. Now, CMMC was introduced in January 2021 and put into effect with DFARS 7021, which requires members of the defense supply chain to submit a self-certification to the DOD's supplier performance risk system prior to getting any new contracts or contract renewals. Now, NIST 800-172 kind of sits off to the side and can be drawn upon in part or in whole in individual contracts where the assets are considered high value targets. Now, CMMC is a maturity model with five levels. Levels one and two are focused on protecting federal contract information. And this is largely based on the requirements in FAR the Federal Acquisition Regulation. Levels three through five are focused on protecting CUI. And this falls under DFARS 7012 and 7021, as well as ITAR regulations, and includes all of the 110 controls in NIST 800-171. Now, NIST 800-172 includes practices that exist within CMMC levels four and five. How are the flexibility of being able to require individual controls in a contract suggests that suppliers working on high value programs will be able to work with existing CMMC level three organizations and add additional controls, not forcing these organizations into levels four and five whose implementation could be price restricting. So NIST 800-172 does not work on its own, just like DFARS builds on FAR. And it instead, builds on the basic requirements in 800-171. Now, the enhanced security requirements provide the foundation for an attacker-focused, multi-dimensional defense in-depth protection strategy that includes, pardon me, three mutually supportive and reinforcing components, penetration-resistant architecture, damage-limiting operations, and designing for cyber resiliency and survivability. This strategy is spelled out in NIST SP 800-160-2. It recognizes that despite the best protection measures implemented by organizations, advanced persistent threats, APTs, 
will always find ways to compromise or breach boundary defenses and deploy malicious code within a defender's system. When this situation occurs, organizations must have access to safeguards and countermeasures to detect, outmaneuver, confuse, deceive, mislead, and impede the adversary. That is, removing the adversary's tactical advantage while protecting the organization's critical programs and high-value assets. So let's look at how the enhanced requirements are structured. I really like the way these were put together, and they make it super simple to understand alignment with other NIST publications, particularly 800-171. The first way they do this is that the control number aligns exactly with the control in NIST 800-171 and adds an E to designate that it is an enhanced control. Next, there, it includes which protection strategies out of the three we mentioned earlier are affected by the control and enhanced. And finally, it has adversarial effects. And there are five groups of adversary effects that are taken from NIST 800-160-2. And I'll show you those in a minute. So I'm not gonna go through all 35 of the enhanced requirements, but I did wanna take a quick look at how they build on the controls we know and love from NIST 800-171. First, with control 3.1.1, we see that the enhanced control requires MFA. 3.2.1 expands basic security training requirements to include training on threats like social engineering, advanced persistent threats, and also to update the training when there are changes to the nature of a threat. Now, 3.1.2 takes the existing requirement to just scan for vulnerabilities and adds the need to perform actual threat hunting in your environment. As you can see, these enhancements range from things that are literally must-dos in the case of MFA to advanced capabilities that are beyond the technical capabilities of many smaller defense contractors, which highlights why the decision was made to allow agencies to mandate individual controls in their contracts. So let's take a deeper look on those protection strategies. These are covered in great depth in NIST 800-160 Volume 2 and provide the pillars of NIST 800-172. Now, NIST 160 weighs in with over 200 pages, but is really worth taking a look at. Even if you aren't going to read the entire thing, I really suggest that everybody jumps in and reads Appendix J, which discusses how cyber resiliency would play out in the 2015 and 2016 attacks on the Ukrainian power grid. It's a really cool real world example that shows how a security framework would have limited damage. Now, Penetration-resistant architecture is a no-brainer. Systems must be architected to prevent intrusion. More than half of the 35 controls in 172 impact the creation and securing of this architecture. Damage-limiting operations is focused on detecting compromises and limiting the effect of both detected and undetected compromises. And cyber resiliency is about withstanding and recovering from attacks. Each of these, in turn, are supported by the adversarial effects that are listed in the controls. Now, there are five high-level desired effects on adversaries and attackers. Redirect, preclude, impede, limit, and expose. Now, each adversarial effect is further broken down to include 15 specific impacts on risk and expected results. These adversarial effects are also described in depth in NIST 800-160. Within redirect, we have deter, divert, and deceive. This includes technologies like sandboxing, detonation chambers, honeypots, and practices like tainting, where you put deliberately misleading information in systems to lure attackers away from real CUI. Preclude is broken up into expunge, preempt, and negate. The goal of this impact is to ensure that a threat event does not have the impacts that are desired by the attacker. Impede includes actions to make it more difficult for threat events and actors to cause negative consequences, and it's further broken down into contain, degrade, <clears throat> delay, and exert. Limit, like it sounds, is effects intended to shorten the duration or reduce the degree of damage from a threat event. And finally, within expose, we have detect, scrutinize, and reveal. This not only includes threat hunting, but also participating in threat intelligence data feeds to inform actions. Together, these have real world impacts on a sensitive system that holds CUI and 
what is able to occur within that system before, during, and after a cybersecurity event. So I'm glad that this was able to be done pretty quick. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Give us a like and follow down below. If you do have further questions about NIST 800-171, NIST 800-162, NIST 800-172, CMMC, or any of the cybersecurity frameworks at play within the defense supply chain, please ask the questions down below in the comments. I love to get involved with the community. And thanks again, and have a great day.